Hello, I'm uh, William Stein and I'm from CoCalc and about to give a talk about uh, how IPy widgets work in Jupyter notebooks that are in CoCalc. So uh, here's a little example of an old widget from 2019, which uh, uses the at interact decorator. And then this is what it looks like. And this is all inside of a whiteboard in CoCalc. So I can uh, click here and the widget updates with a different input. And this is using IPy widgets, but embedded in a whiteboard, uh, as you can see. So uh, this, this little talk is like five slides. And the goal is just to explain how IPy widgets are integrated in CoCalc Jupyter Notebooks. And the goal, uh, that's the goal of the talk, and the goal of IPy widgets in um, CoCalc is to uh, basically to support real-time collaboration and work inside of um, our and, and be more React friendly, basically. And so I'll explain our approach to supporting real-time collaboration. What this data set this is. Uh, by the way, the, this these slides, so to speak, are actually just in a whiteboard because I haven't implemented slides yet, and you can find them at this URL right here. Okay, so here's a quick uh, history of the internet um, or of uh, widgets as far as I know them. So uh, in 2008, I went to a workshop at Enthought and Jason Grout, who I don't think was at the workshop, but um, was suggest, he kept bugging us on the mailing list that we needed to add something like Mathematica's manipulate to the Sage notebook. And um, Mathematica had very recently and was extremely excited about this thing called manipulate, which, which is exactly like IPy widgets, but for Mathematica notebooks back in like 2007. And um, you know, before all the other stuff like uh, that Stephen Wolfram got excited about, this is the big thing he was excited about, was enabling interactivity. And I think Jason saw his colleagues using this at BYU and it was really, really enhancing their teaching a lot. So he thought that we desperately needed this in Sage Notebooks. Um, also, so at that workshop, I was going to work on something else, but then Jason kept bugging me to work on this. And uh, somebody gave a presentation about how Enthought had developed this traits mechanism. And a lot of their like custom functionality they developed for clients was basically interactive widget type applications um, built around big Python libraries. But with it wasn't web based so much, but it was. Uh, uh, so I decided to try to do something similar for the Sage notebook, and uh, it worked. And it ended up getting used a huge amount in um, Sage. So if you click on this, if you were to look at this wiki page right here, it um, has links to you know, hundreds of different um, interactive widgets that people used in teaching classes. And these are this is a wiki page, but you can. For any one of these, you can actually click evaluate and use the uh, widget directly here. This is, these are all embeddable as static HTML in any website using the Sage cell server, uh, which is a way to run interact IPy widgets on any random website, which initially was written by Jason Krupp. Um, but there's one big problem with at interact and the way we developed this in Sage, I mean, a really big problem, which is every single time you evaluate the widget, it would draw the plot again. And um, constantly people, anytime they saw this, like uh, uh, workshops or students, they would always want to do 3D graphics and manipulate you know, elements of a 3D scene. And they were very sad when they realized that if you added a slider or something, the second you move it, it would redraw the entire scene and push it back out to the browser, like messing up your orientation with it and with a big delay. And it was a much worse experience as compared to, um, say, Mathematica. And there are a lot of other things that you naturally want to do to make an application that just, you know, this, this approach didn't extend to. So it was too clunky. Um, so that was 2008. And then years later in 2013, I wrote, uh, I just rewrote at Interact basically from scratch for Sage Worksheets. Sage Worksheets are very similar to Jupyter Notebooks, except it's one single code mirror document. And it uses code mirrors. Um, widgets to represent the output. So you can put a little HTML element in 
a code mirror document and get the output as a widget. And this is actually used a lot still. Um, here's what it looks like. So this is, see it's a, a single code mirror document for the entire notebook, so to speak. And then here's an example of a widget and you can, and this is just like a, a DOM element. Then in uh, 2014, um, I just looked at GitHub because I didn't know the history of Jupyter widgets, but apparently in 2014, a student named Jonathan Frederick, who now works at Google, um, did a student project with Min and Brian and wrote the first version of iPy widgets. Um, and that well, there's, you know, activity was got pretty heavy at that point. And then I think Jason, you went to work at Bloomberg and started working a lot on iPy widgets sort of steadily ever since. Um, and the thing that that you got is much, much, much more powerful than this at interact decorator because it lets you create individual widgets and then connect them with each other, connect them to code, connect code to them, and also create custom widgets, which lets you make take basically very complicated, arbitrarily complicated front end applications, connect them up with arbitrarily complicated back end kernels and have it all work together, which is really amazing. Um, but none of the above have real time collaboration support. So there's some interesting issues involved with trying to get uh, real time collaboration support to work. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick little demo just to kind of show you what the current situation is. Um, so what I'll do is just open, oops, uh, Jupyter Lab right here. And then so here is a um, widget in Jupyter Lab and so I'll well, I guess I already evaluated, but I'll run it again. So here it is. And this is JupyterLab with real-time collaboration enabled. So just to illustrate that, I will show it side by side. Um, but an issue that comes up is when you load the same URL in both of them, um, what? I guess I have to, why isn't it just, oh, right, it's not, I guess I have to find the thing and open it, um, sorry. Okay, good, so here it is. But notice that when you open it again, it just has, it doesn't show you the widget uh, at all. And so you have to reevaluate this side. Um, but notice it does have uh, Jupyter's very nice RTC support running, which just deals with the code. Um, but now when I evaluate this side, then the, um, the output goes away over here. And when I change things, it works fine on the right-hand side, but then the left-hand side is kind of left behind, doesn't know what's going on. Um, similarly, if I you know, evaluate just a basic slider, you can slide, see that when I evaluate it over here, it's now broken over here. So then I can evaluate over here. And now it works in both of them, but then there's no um, relationship between them, except that if I do w.value, it will actually work in both of them because that sends a message from the kernel that they both see. Okay, so that's the situation with Jupyter, which is that it doesn't support uh, real-time collaboration with widgets. And uh, I think that it's unclear to everybody that it should or how it should. Um, that's my impression hearing people talk, but I think it actually should support real-time collaboration. And it's pretty clear what it should do in my opinion. Here's how it looks to do exactly the same thing in CoCalc. Um, so here's the same notebook. Uh, I just loaded it and I don't have to reevaluate anything. It's already there. And I can do something like click on the slider here and it reruns the code and both of them are in sync. And just to give a little sense of the speed, um, sorry that my, but this bar is here, okay. So uh, you can see that as I drag this one, the other one moves. But it, this is making a round trip to the server. It's not peer to peer or anything like the um, YJS sync would be. So it's 
it's synced, but via the server. So this is kind of like a worst case scenario for how this is working. Okay, so that's the demo. My hope, by the way, is just the next, I mean, now I'm gonna show you the um, architecture of how CoCalc does this and hope that maybe uh, IPy widgets will consider switching to an architecture like this at some point or offering it as an alternative. And then you'll have real-time sync for IPy widgets everywhere instead. Okay, so here's the uh, little architecture diagram of how IPy widgets work in CoCalc. So this one slide explaining this is really the whole point of this talk. And the um, picture is as follows. You have the um, backend project, which is running a single Node.js process, which is, we call it the project server. Um, if you click on this link in the slides that you can get from what I posted, you'll see the source code for it. It's a package. It's a, it runs and it manages real-time synchronization. And it also um, acts very much like the Python Jupyter kernel server, except it's written in Node.js. Uh, but it serves really exactly the same, same purpose. And there's you know, a bunch of, potentially a bunch of different Jupyter kernel processes that are running in your project. And from the point of view of IPy widgets, the, uh, uh, the project server, what it does is it looks, it sees call messages that come from the kernel and it updates a key value store that's distributed and eventually consistent that's purely in memory uh, as a result of call messages that it sees. So that's its main, um, the, the main thing it does. It also deals with garbage collection because you, know, you can create lots of models of widgets and all kinds of data, uh, and then it can suddenly go out of scope uh, in that, or, I mean, it's not being used in any way anymore. Um, so you need to somehow garbage collect it. Um, so you have the project server. On the other side, you have people's web browsers. So a whole bunch of these web browsers and they're displaying widgets and managing them. And sitting between all that running, there's some code that runs both in the project and in the front end, and it manages a distributed key value store. And it's a pretty simple, it's, I mean, this is much, much simpler than say YJS or CoCalc's real-time collaboration code for notebooks, because it's really just a key value store. Um, the keys are strings, the values are JavaScript objects, and there's a way to uh, overwrite or create new ones. And that's the only functionality that's available with this key value store. And the or, um, constraint it satisfies is that eventually everybody will be looking at the same key value store. And you can just like refresh your browser and you get back the same key value store. It loads the same thing. So with that um, basic, uh, building block, uh, that's how everything works. So the state, the data that's stored in the key value store is the state of each of the models. This is the serialized state. Um, also the update. So sometimes uh, models get modified via a patch or something. Some like field gets changed. So the result of making all updates to a model that's also stored in the table for each model. Um, buffers are stored in the model. And currently they're very stupidly stored in the model as um, uh, as JavaScript objects. And I think there is like, anyways, there, this is not done in efficient enough manner and that will get changed. Namely the buffer will get replaced by like a reference to the buffer and then it'll get pulled in via HTTP or some other method. Uh, and then custom messages also get placed in the tables like the last message that gets sent. Um, and so the backend, again, it's just, responsible are taking con messages and writing stuff to the table. And sometimes maybe changes to the table get written back. Um, the front end, it has a widget manager. The widget manager, it derives from the base widget manager in um, IPy widgets. And it um, is responsible for taking the data from this table and creating all of the relevant models and updating the models as data in the table changes. And also what it does is it watches for change events on the models. And when the model changes, it creates updates to this table, which then gets seen by all the other users and also by the backend. Uh, it completely ignores the comm messages that get created uh, on the front end for the most part, and just watches directly for change events from backbone on the tables, I mean, on the models. 
so that's the responsibility of the front end and the manager runs only on the front end and does that. And then there's also a React component that renders widgets. So, you know, it sees that there's a Jupyter widget JSON MIME type message, and then it creates the corresponding view um, typically, and then uh, using Lumino and renders it in most cases. Uh, in some cases, the views are created using React or AntD so that they look more consistent with the rest of our uh, user interface. But in most cases, widgets are just rendered via their own um, view code. And um, that's the architecture. So um, in the middle is a key value store where the state is uh, stored. And then there's um, a project that's responsible for taking the kernel messages and updating that state. And the front end takes changes to the model and updates that state. Then everybody sees the result. And the, the current value of a model is a result of taking the state and combining it with the updates. And this front end widget manager does a, um, basically reproduces a lot of functionality that's in the base widget manager, but has to be done differently due to uh, how the data is stored. So for example, it does all the dereferencing of models itself, um, uh, et cetera. Okay. All right, so then um, just a little discussion about where the status of IPy widgets sits in CoCalc's Jupyter implementation. So there's a lot of functionality that's still missing. Um, I think most basic widgets built into IPy widgets work, um, but with possibly some surprises, like maybe I missed a font awesome icon or something, um, or there's some other subtle issue involving CSS with the DOM, um, maybe hit a bug. Um, I've tried third-party widgets recently in the last couple of weeks, and every single one I've tried has been horribly broken in one way or another. Not, I, I mean, in many cases, it's due to just things Functionality I haven't implemented yet, but they assume it's there. Or there are a lot of assumptions they make, for example, th that are not made by the built-in widgets that are part of IPy widgets itself. Uh, as an example, when you um, create a model in the widget manager, um, what I was doing was just creating the model and then passing in the deserialized state later. And then the model would update itself to appear proper or to have like the right um, state. Uh, in K3D, it assumes just in one little line of code that you passed in the deserialized state in the constructor. So, and if you try to update things later, it's just broken. So it's just like this assumption that this optional input is there and it only gets one field out of it. There's an object ID that it stores somewhere. So to do its own sort of reference, to, to do its own management of things. So there's like, there will be subtle, there are a lot of subtle things where, you know, you really have to do as much as possible exactly like IPy widgets does it or upstream third-party widgets are going to break. And um, yeah, so I'm trying to tangle, untangle these issues and um, I think the future is very bright for widgets basically. Uh, okay, so I just took just over 20 or just about 20 minutes and I'm just going to move back to the slide that shows the architecture and see if there are any questions about this. And also, I'm just going to note that if you want to look at any of the relevant code, there's little links in here to the code. Um, so you can like click and see it. So any questions? I have two questions I put in the chat, but I'll just uh, ask you uh, first the architecture question. Do you handle, uh, so Button, for example, uses custom messages to indicate click events. I think Plotly uses custom messages to transfer state back and forth. Uh, you, you said you ignored the custom messages totally. So do Button- Well, definitely um, for K3D, I noticed there was there were custom messages from the back end to the front end to, for example, starting animation running. And um, that uses message custom. So those all do get passed. So if the kernel sends a call message uh, from the back end, it does get passed on to the front end as expected. Um, and I see no reason not to implement things going in the other direction, but I haven't, I think I haven't done that yet. Uh, in that everything I've run into so far, the 
message passing the other direction um, isn't necessary. It was all to change the state of models. And that happens anyways, just by updating this table. But I'm sure, of course, as you point out, there are many custom messages going the other direction that various third party widgets have defined, and they're just going to be you know, silently broken in CoCalc until I um, use the same mechanism to send messages back. So, um, so yeah, the answer to your question is, I think messages currently, custom messages currently don't get passed from the front end browser to the back end. The mechanism by which that would happen is in the widget manager. Um, when you call the function to send a custom message, you would write something to this part of the table, and then the back end project server would then send a message to the um, kernel. But I have so there's a plan to implement that. I'm not saying it's a bad idea or anything, just that it's not currently implemented in CoCalc. So currently the core widget click event doesn't work, I assume. Which uses um, messages from the front end to the back end. If probably not. Okay. Probably doesn't work. Um and I had a second question yeah. about your demo. Uh what version of yes. would you put that? Was that the latest? So, yeah, it's the it's the latest on NPM. So at late, you know, just whatever the default is. I guess seven is the default right now. For isn't it? Or is it it is whatever the latest version is on NPM? Python version, I guess, is what I'm asking. Because seven point oh. seven does implement a a very minimal real-time collaboration uh, mm. messages that Martin Brettles put in. Ah, um, so you mean for the uh, Jupyter de lab demo? The uh, apparently, it's too old to use the stuff that Martin put in because it didn't work. Well, um, don't you do uh, opt-in for uh, the seven dot x? Um... That's right. Yes, I forgot. Uh, yeah, if you set an environment variable, then ah. it opt-ins opts in to the to the com message reflection. Essentially, is what it is. Enabling the no. collaboration, so it's turned on by default in eight, optional. Cool. Seven point seven. Well, I mean, that would be that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, sure can I ask a that. question uh, about exactly this? Uh, because mm -hmm. we 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 thought about uh, this uh, for a long time, uh, like how to do this, and we we have a version. And one of the issues that we had um, was basically if you have a um, high latency and you move your slider, you get like, uh, say 10 messages mm -hmm. and then it round trips back to the uh, front end. Yeah. Um, do you somehow filter the messages that you, uh, that you know, like, okay, I, I, I know that I send out uh, 10 and uh, the, the nine that I get back, I have to skip those. Otherwise you get like, basically your slider is moving back again. Do you have something uh, like that implemented? The slider doesn't move back, but uh, the problem you're describing certainly is pretty noticeable with, this is an example where there's huge, where it takes a huge amount of time to, I mean, that's kind of like what you're describing right now. Every single one of these evaluations, partly because it's drawing a whole fractal takes a long time. So notice it didn't like move my slider the wrong way um, as it did this, but it certainly does, there's a whole bunch of, uh, updates that come back. Um, so, so do you send back yeah. the message also to the, uh, the client that, uh, generated the message or do you only send it back to all the other clients? So it's, it's really updating a table rather than there's a message that says update this key value store to have this value. And that's that's like the only that's basically the only primitive we we have like everything's built on that primitive, which is update this key value store so that this the you know so that this key has that value. And when you drag the slider, it's going to make um, you know several different updates, and then uh, those get sent to the back end, and then the back end will broadcast those back to the front ends. But it certainly won't undo something that was you know sent out to be set. Um, so, so basically what we had is if you would move the slider, like, uh, first to say it would trigger a message going to one and then to like minus 10 mm -hmm. you first, uh, get back, it will, would echo back the value for one. So the slider would go to one and then it, you would get the echo back from slider uh, minus 10. I think my, my key value story, I think I have a timestamp so that, mm. 
uh, with, it's a key with a timestamp. And so if you receive them, I, I think that no matter what, if you receive information saying, hey, I'd like you to set this key to this value and the timestamp for when this was supposed to happen is before your current timestamp, then it just ignores it. So I, I, I think I ran into exactly that kind of problem. So, so all real-time collaboration, everything in CoCalc is built on top of this key value store. And so it has to, it has to deal with that kind of issue. And I think the way I dealt with it, I wrote this, I mean, I, I haven't looked at the exact code that's relevant in four years, but I believe it stores a timestamp and just discards any message that's saying, set the key to a value that was in the past. And so the one that sent out the update would have the latest timestamp. So one of the basic primitives in CoCalc when it connects is that it synchronizes the clock using like a, you know, an algorithm at the back end, and also, if your browser's clock is off, shows you a huge um, error, you know, warning message saying nothing's going to work. Although it actually will work because it does synchronize the clock using an internal algorithm. But just in case, just to scare you, it also does that. Um, so if you if you know the current time, a lot of algorithms become a lot easier. And so we yeah. do make that assumption that we have the current time, and then throughout the yeah. UI we assume that. And it, it's like a cheat, just like you know how yeah. Git assumes that SHA one hashes don't collide, collide yeah. and that makes a lot yeah. of things way easier, even though it isn't really true. So, yeah. so that's how we're so cheating. Basically, uh, assume, assuming you have a synchronized clock. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, we thought about that and we thought we couldn't do that. So we had a different yeah. solution, but, um, but yeah. Well, I can tell you that you can do it, but you might piss off a few users. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you really, I mean, you if you do that, it's very important, I think, to to show a message in the front end to users saying, hey, and also to, you know, to, to be pretty sure of what the time really is, which um, you can do via some synchronization method with the backend. So we have yeah. code where um, we don't use new data everywhere. We use something called, I think, backend time or, or server time. And that's the correct time on the server. And it's, you know, the accuracy is maybe up to a half second or something like that, but that's enough for, for this sort of problem. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question about sure. the slide showing the architecture? Yes, let me go back there. Uh, there's, a, I think, a tremendous simplification in here in that you show that this key value store exists on both the front end and the back end, and they yeah. magically are the same. I assume, yeah. technically, those are two things, and there's some real-time yeah. collaboration protocol going in, in between those. Is that the yes. protocol that you are using elsewhere yeah. in CoCalc? Yeah, except so, so, so my basic primitive for developing real-time collaboration is a key value store. And then like, so in the sync, in CoCal, in at CoCalc slash sync, there's one directory, which is a key value store. It implements that from, from basic principles. And then there's a completely different directory, which is all about building up uh, editing of strings, editing of JSON documents, et cetera, um, on top of the assumption that you have a distributed key value store. So that's the approach that CoCalc takes. Um, and so this is somewhat complicated. It's not really that complicated though to implement a distributed key value store. It's really complicated implementing collaboration on you know, arbitrary JSON documents with all the right semantics and tracking of the history and all that. But a key value store is pretty easy um, to do in comparison. Especially, and um, I also, just one little detail, I don't implement deleting of objects from this. Uh, if you need to delete an object, you can set it to null, but it's still like the key will be there indefinitely and the value is null. So that's the closest thing to deleting because it's really hard to delete objects given that any client could disappear from the network arbitrarily long and then come back later. And so you want, yeah, so I don't worry about that. But I, yeah, so this, this is complicated, but it's not that complicated. It's relatively easy. Um, like the, the philosophy here is very much like React where you have some, some, some thing that you can trust that fires off events when things change and then other things react to that. Um, that's the perspective. Do you handle custom deserialization? The custom deserialization? Yeah, I have to, I had to change the code a bit to do deserialization. Uh, and it does, yeah, it calls the custom deserializers properly. I, I'm not sure, I don't think it, it, the code was a total disaster before, but when I, I did rewrite it properly to deal with K3D and um, 
Yeah, so now I'm pretty happy with the custom deserializers. K3D very extensively uses custom serializing and deserializing because it's for visualizing large data and stores all the data in buffers. Um, and just to emphasize a, a huge shortcoming in CodeCalc's iPy widgets right now is the buffers are just encoded in normal JSON messages as text. And so they're really slow. And that's on my to-do list for this week is to rewrite how that works. Uh, because that really makes like using like volume visualizations and stuff are just broken in terms of complexity. Um, but I think that's a, a problem that can be addressed. Pointers to some third-party store of the binary yep. data and then just Okay. Yeah. 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 Store store them somewhere else, and then use probably uh, maybe just grab them over HTTP. HTTP is good for that to avoid blocking up the WebSocket. Because um, that's how all the images in Jupyter notebooks are served. It's the same. It could be the exact same um, HTTP server. Okay. I'm a uh, couple of minutes over time, but are there any other comments or questions? I don't know. I'm just to end. I'm super enthusiastic about IPy widgets, and <laughs> so, and I think that the, I mean, I'm most enthusiastic because Pete's here, and you know, we have like basically three completely different integrations of a core um, design in, uh, and that I think and then there's these literally hundreds of third-party widgets out there. So it's a, it's a pretty, um, pretty awesome. A uh, piece of functionality. I mean, an idea that can combine together arbitrarily complicated apps in a browser with arbitrarily complicated apps in the back end. That's an incredibly powerful uh, tool. So, um, yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> one, one other question. So, at Databricks yeah. and Colab and VS Code, uh, it's important to iframe these third party widgets, uh, yeah. especially the third party widgets. Uh, even, even the core widgets, I think everyone's iframing, but, but, Within I'm not them. yet, but I really should. Okay. I was wondering yeah. if there were specific reasons why you decided not to, or if it was just not implemented yet. I basically, I right now it's just been the challenge of not doing it, but to, I mean, it's actually challenging to not iframe them because you have to deal with your environment a little more. But um, I think that I, I think it's unavoidable for obviously for security reasons. But one, one issue is I'm not, I'm doing third party widgets, but in a way where, uh, I mean, CodeCalc is very much a managed service. So I don't have any requirement that users um, can plug in their own third-party widgets. So my plan is really that uh, I'm gonna NPM install the front-end code for all the IPy widgets that are, and then they'll be served as a separate chunk by Webpack when you load them. And yeah, I mean, that's how the code is currently implemented. If you look here, uh, wait import. So. Here's how K3D gets loaded. Um, so I've NPM installed a specific, K3D I rewrote the front end, but I've NPM installed the dependencies for that. And you know, for the other ones, I, which don't, I've commented them out because I don't want to ship the code, but I'm, I think what I'm going to end up with is like 20 different third-party widgets that are fully supported in CoCalc and they're all NPM installed as part of building CoCalc and then, you know, imported as a separate chunk when you actually load them. Um, that looks so like for that reason, I can trust them. I can trust the front end part of them at least. It looks if, like you're not dealing with version numbers. You're just loading whatever version of the JavaScript you have rather than Yeah, the, but that's in package JSON. So, uh, <laughs> so the problem is the back end code could be out of sync with this, but on the other hand, we manage the back end code too. So, so at least for, uh, for iframing security, the core widgets can still be used for like XSS against other users. Yeah. But a lot of things could be used for XSS. Uh, I mean, not just widgets, like just HTML. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you iframe that too, Pete? Or at least sanitize yeah. it? Oh, yeah. They, yes, they iframe right. everything. It's amazing. But we, we don't uh, iframe uh, console outputs. So it's just like print statements. Uh, theoretically, it could stop iframing uh, like images as well. Uh, but if you do like if you do a print statement and then throw in HTML tag, then we'll just convert the entire output to the uh, iframe. That's just a performance improvement. Uh, but yeah, these are uh, these are critical security issues for Colab because if you can do arbitrary code execution, then suddenly that's uh, arbitrary code execution with your uh, Google account creds. And, yeah. Um, 
to care who doesn't like us on that. Yeah. Um, yes. Mining. Yes. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. I worry a lot about uh, arbitrary code on our public share server more. And, but for the actual notebooks, um, I'm just using basically like the Jupyter notebook trust model where, you know, when you open a notebook, it's very restricted. And, um, but then when you click the trucks button or evaluate code, then it becomes uh, much less restricted because after all, I mean, you could run arbitrary code in the project just by executing Python code. So, um, so there's a lot of problems there as well. But yeah, uh, if I if I end up doing iframes for widgets, it's mainly going to be because of issues with the DOM and the CSS rather than issues with uh, security, I think. But I'll end up in the same place. Because you can vet the JavaScript going into the Yeah, system. yeah. You don't display things by default. You wait for users to execute the code. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a, a small restricted subset of the most popular IPy widgets that our users really need for various purposes. Um, yeah, like if you publish something, try to get somebody else to use your notebook, they're still using exactly that same JavaScript that you wanted. But of course, you know, you could, the user could embed a, um, could embed some sort of bad content in any widget or any HTML in any notebook. And um, that doesn't tend to be much of an attack surface for our students in classes model or for people running things internally. Since you have this model of uh, a managed service where you're controlling the versions uh, and yeah. the migration plan, or is there a way for a professor to run you know, their notebook under last year's CoCalc uh, uh, environment? Uh, so for the, for the backend server, we do store a huge number of different environments. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, we have a, a large number of backend environments snapshot to, you know, snapshotted. So if you want to run CoCalc from May 31st, 2021, you can do that. So that's the entire backend software environment, but the front end code that you're running in your browser is not that particular version. Um, we do have a way of running a particular version of it. We do actually save every single front end version ever, and you can switch to it, but uh, sometimes there are subtle bugs in the front end. We don't want people to run old versions. So, um, so, so you may you have really, to yeah. Back end, yeah. an older version of IPy widgets, front end needs to load one of several different uh, front end versions of the, of the widget code. Yeah, we're, I'm sure we won't support that though. Uh, if you're, if you're, if that were this, if that was the situation, then um, like we'll support exactly one of these. And if you're trying to use an old image, maybe it just doesn't work. And yeah. Um, the, the difficulty we run into with that is when we want to upgrade and then suddenly like whenever we flip that switch uh, mm -hmm. because it's a hosted service, then it's like suddenly your K3D or whatever, when we, upgrade the major version, um, trying to make sure that notebooks, which were working yesterday, suddenly work today. Um, yeah, I mean, our, when we upgrade K3D, we'd upgrade the JavaScript library, then the front end gets updated. And if there's an incompatibility, if the backend is suddenly incompatible, like the whole Python library is incompatible with the new backend, then we would also update the backend. And we have an error message that says, you must restart your project for this to work. And then when you restart your project, it, it works again. Um, there was an API change in the back end, in which case you have to update your notebooks. Okay. You'd have to refresh your browser, I guess. Yeah. Well, if, well, if the upgraded if, library actually has a different uh, API. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we should upgrade our front end to match that if we're aware of it. If we're not aware of it, then there may be a problem. So, but I mean, we're, we're managing the whole stack on the front end and the back end. So in theory, we can um, we can do a good job with particular software people are actually using. I mean, the other thing is for our users, at least, if they're they're trying to use something and it doesn't work, they click this button, and a few minutes later we're looking at them looking at the problem, and then we fix it because it just makes a support ticket, and it like you know 
you can easily say, hey, I'm making a support ticket about that file and that file. And we look at their file you know, live and know exactly what's going on. That is so, really nice. And it's just like, and when you click here, it embeds information about exactly what file you're currently looking at when you clicked to make the support ticket. So, um, it's a, the, there's so many constraints that I think are different when the in our environment than they might be in other environments. Um, I also added something. So if you try to use a widget and it fails, it shows an error message. And then underneath it, it has a link that you can click on that makes a support ticket with information about the fact that it's a widget that failed and here's the relevant notebook. So whenever somebody tries to use a third-party widget and it's not the front end doesn't support it yet, then we'll be very easily notified of that by them. And they can explain why they want it. And then we can put work into that. So, I mean, the idea with CoCalc is like, it's a collated managed ecosystem of the best of IPy widgets that comes out of the much more general ecosystem that just, you know, you don't even know, like you guys don't even know what these 300 uh, extensions are or how, how many of them work. But, you know, there's a few that are extremely good. And those are the ones that will be made fully available here. And then the fallback, of course, is Jupyter Lab is just a click away for people to um, go that route if necessary. So, thank you, William. Yes, really appreciate. Thank it. you. And if you can send me link a link to this, I can put it in the YouTube description. Okay, it should be in the um, in our notes. I put it at the bottom. Fantastic. Thank you. It's um, yeah, it's a little sucky because when you look at it publicly shared, you see a top-down view of all the slides and they're really tiny and you have to tediously zoom in on each one because <laughs> it the whiteboard isn't meant for slideshows it's just that i haven't wrote, written a slideshow program yet well thanks for the in progress demo um, yeah thanks so much for the for the information i'll stop the recording <laughs>